Right then, inside this box is a cheap steel road bike frame that I picked up on AliExpress. It cost me 377 quid delivered to my house. Plus, I didn't get stung with any additional import fees either, which is pretty cool. So I'm going to go over this thing with a fine tooth comb, importantly, kind of focusing on the welds, right? Because I, I figure if they're trying to kind of rush production and save costs that way, the, the welds are going to be pretty obviously affected, actually. So yeah, my name, as always, is Luke. Welcome back to Trace Fellow. Hi there, welcome back. Good to see you. So firstly, this frame took absolutely ages to get delivered. I bought it with my own cash and got it from this random AliExpress store that I'd not used before, actually. This isn't like a collaboration with the brand Seaboard. Before buying this frame, I'd not really heard much about them, actually, although apparently they have a pretty good reputation. Now, I ordered it 19th of Jan and it arrived a couple of days ago. So yeah, yeah it took like two and a half months to get to my house quite a long time. So was it worth it? Well, let's find out. But firstly, have a quick look at this. Okay, so this frame got, got to me find everything in the post. So this pouch is just completely full, if I pull them all out, of like stamps. Some of them have clearly been used because you can see there's a kind of a postage stamp or postage mark on that. Yeah, really, really, really strange because they've clearly been peeled off other packages. Although looking at these a little bit closer, can you see 202503? Same with this one here. But yeah, it looks like they all got stamped for, for payment. Even on these little ones here, kind of looks like 202503. So yeah, maybe this is legitimately how they paid for postage. <laughs> really, really odd. But anyway, putting aside the slightly odd stamp <laughs> situation for the postage, um, yeah, it's all packaged up really well. So you got some foam covering the frame here and then this air filled packaging. And I'm hoping inside there's gonna be the frame, the fork and the seat post for this thing. So let's get it all out. So just getting it unpacked here, frame, carbon fork, headset bearings, yeah, all good. But the seat post, well, a bit more on that later. So here it is, it comes in a few colors, but I've gone for a basic clear coat. So you can still see the nice brushed finish on the steel. And importantly, you can easily make out the welds too. Now this is an XL frame, should support up to 30 C tires. And apparently it's constructed using chromoly or chromium molybdenum steel. So it should be pretty corrosion resistant too. Now the brake hose for the rear caliper goes through the down tube and out the back underneath the bottom bracket area. So there is some internal cable routing, but both gear cables are routed externally, which is gonna be quite nice actually when it comes to building this thing up. It makes a change from all the fully integrated frames I've, I've built up recently. It's also worth noting, I'm gonna run a two by 11 mechanical group set, but there's no front derailleur hanger. So I've got a clamp on adapter coming in the post. Right then, I've literally just pulled this out of the box and got it unpacked and a couple of things have kind of struck me about it already. Firstly, it should have come with a seat post that wasn't included. So I messaged the seller just now and they got back to me pretty much immediately with an apology and they're gonna send me one in the post. So um, yeah, it wasn't included, but it seems like a genuine mistake. So I, I can let them off and yeah, they're gonna send one pretty much free of charge. So that's cool. Secondly, the through axles on this fork. So this is the carbon fork that was included with the frame. Looks all right, I'll have a kind of closer look at it in a minute, but I noticed this straight away. So it has this weird screw hanging out the side of the, of the fork here. And then I also noticed there's no aluminium insert that's kind of molded into the carbon for the through axle to actually screw into. So on virtually all the other carbon forks I've dealt with, they look a little bit like this. So uh, one side looks normal, then the other side, you have an aluminium insert molded into the carbon and the threads are cut into that, which is what kind of holds the through axle in place. So yeah, I had a look at the actual through axle included and it's got this weird nubbing on the top with um, kind of threads in it. And basically that gets affixed there using, using that, that screw. And then yeah, the threads are on the outside of the fork. I mean, it should work absolutely fine, but I've never seen that before. Now again, with the included carbon fork here. So you've got this steerer tube here and it's a little bit messy. It's got a bit of release agent, I think, left on it. But if I show you, you've got carbon on the outside, but then the inside is lined with fiberglass. You can see clearly a black ring of carbon on the outside and then a much lighter fiberglass liner. So yeah, most of the carbon forks that I've dealt with look like this, so carbon all the way through. Whereas yeah, you've got a thick lining of fiberglass on there. So that's basically designed to prevent galvanic corrosion of either the Stana or the compressor plug here, both of which are included in the headset kit actually, which is cool. So you can choose whichever one you want. But yeah, having a fiberglass lining means that these are less likely to get galvanically corroded inside when you get sweat or water down the steerer tube. It is quite a thick layer 
of fiberglass though ones that i've seen usually have a slightly thinner layer so let me know if you think that, 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 that's normal. But um, yeah, either way, good to see fiberglass on the inside of the steerer tube. Now on the actual frame itself here, one of the, well, one of the first things I noticed is that well, we're missing a bottle cage bolt there. I mean, not, not a huge deal. Maybe it just fell out before they put it in the box, but I've got a whole drawer of them in here. So I don't really care, but yeah, that, that was, that was missing out of the box. And secondly, the headset. So uh, essentially I'm, I'm used to dealing in carbon frames where the bearing seats for the, for the headset uh, bearings, they're, they're molded into the actual carbon. Whereas on here, this is just a steel tube, right? So you actually have these things. So maybe it's the same on other steel frames and maybe some aluminium ones as well, but you get these cups here. So these are machined out of aluminium. You've got one for the bottom here and, and, and one for the top. And I'm gonna have to press fit these in. So basically they're gonna have to be pressed in the top and the bottom there because they're quite a quite a tight fit. Uh, I, I have a, a bottom bracket press that I can use to press fit these in. But yeah, I've never, never had to do that before actually. But yeah, that's the frame. I think next up, what I'm actually gonna do is use my endoscope and look inside some of the tubes because I can actually fit one down here. I think I can fit one down there as well. So I got my endoscope out. I'll have a look at the welds and also have a look inside the frame as well. Right then, mainly because I got this really cool footage while I was lucky enough to be out skiing, well, well snowboarding in Bulgaria last week, <laughs> Sirocco. So I wear their cycle kit on every ride that I do, but they also do some wicked looking ski gear. I know the extreme levels of pink aren't necessarily for everyone, but yeah, just ever so quickly, it'd be great if you could check them out. They're such a great sponsor. And if you use my link below, you can get 10% off anything they do, cycle kit, workout gear, ski gear, and even golf stuff now, actually, yeah. All, all sorts. So check them out and thank you very much. So let's start with the welds here. To my eye, yeah, they look pretty good actually. The beads are relatively consistent in width and spacing, no visible weld splatter, blow through, or signs of any pinholes, which would kind of suggest porosity in the welds. Overall, yeah, it looks clean, suggesting a pretty decently controlled TIG welding process. However, I am fully aware that I am just some random douchebag in a garage. My, my, my knowledge of welding mainly comes from places like these YouTube shorts where trainee welders are asked to guess their hourly rate based on the quality of their welding. So uh, yeah, needless to say, much like the average GCN presenter discussing a well-priced road bike for the average cyclist, I don't really know what I'm talking about. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, I, so I spoke to someone that does. Now, one of my brother's friends actually from way back holds a PhD in welding, which is pretty, pretty bonkers. He works on exponentially higher budget industrial welding projects. So this was a kind of a little, little bit beneath his pay grade, but he, well, his two cents, the welds look decent. He pointed out that the corrosion that you can see in these clips where I'm putting an endoscope inside the tubes to look behind the weld, as it were, yeah, it's nothing to worry about. It's just surface rust. And according to him, it's essentially unavoidable. Now he made a point to stress that unless you do something like a destructive test, pulling the welds apart or maybe cutting them in half, it's difficult to fully assess their quality. But his overall opinion, not like the best welding he's ever seen, but he said, yeah, at least visually, a decent real world example of, of some TIG welding. So definitely good enough for me, gets a pass in my book. However, he did mention one other important factor, heat treatment. When welding chromoly steel, apparently heat treatment is, is, is pretty crucial. So in industrial applications, the components will typically undergo a heat treatment before the weld, followed by a second post-weld heat treatment or PWHT. Skipping this second heat treatment step, which could hypothetically be done to reduce costs, can lead to increased brittleness in the heat affected zone, essentially those welds, which in the case of a bike frame like this, could lead to those areas cracking over time. Now, in an ideal scenario, this chromoly frame would have undergone PWHT to relieve any residual stresses in the welds, but was this done and is this level of post-processing strictly necessary for a cheap steel bike frame like this? That's a bit harder to say. If there are any professional frame fabricators out there, yeah, I'd love to hear your opinion, actually. Still, just to be thorough, I fired over this question to Seaboard Support yesterday. So yeah, we'll see what they come back with. Now, a few other bits on this frame. The BSA bottom bracket threads are well tapped. I fitted the bottom bracket cups 
threads are smooth, everything seems fine. The rear derailleur hanger fits really nicely into the frame here. The rear brake mounts look great. The front looks pretty good too. Although I won't know if everything is square until I build up the bike. And finally, they've got drain holes for pretty much all the tubes and one in the bottom bracket area too, which is good. Now, coming back to these, uh, these bearing cups here. So these ones that kind of need seating in the, in the headset there. Yeah, I initially said I was gonna use this. It's a bottom bracket press that I bought a number of years ago. But unfortunately, this threaded rod, it's not quite long enough, needs to be a bit longer. So I, well, I could go out to Screwfix and buy a longer threaded rod, or I could use this. So uh, an old plastic chopping board, and a hammer. So basically, a couple of years ago, I successfully seated a press fit bottom bracket into a carbon bike frame using those two things. So the kind of method should transfer over quite well. So I'm tempted to give it a go. Ooh. Always working. Ooh. Oh, look at that. One down. One to go. Okay, so I've just popped that cup in there and it's gone, it's gone really well actually. So yeah, the, the bearing fits in there absolutely fine, but I've, I've just noticed this. So I'm thinking about when it comes to replacing these bearings, right? So I had a look inside and on this top bearing here, I'll see if I can focus. You can see the back of it. It protrudes out beyond that kind of bearing cup. So that basically means that you can get something behind the bearing to pull it out. And I've got some tools in here that will work for that. And I've tested it and this bearing will come out fine. But let me show you the one for the kind of bottom cup there. Right, so this bearing cup will go in the bottom of the frame right there. And in the same way, I'm looking behind it, but well, if I zoom in, the bearing doesn't protrude beyond the edge of that bearing cup, like at all really. So getting something behind this bearing in order to push it out in the event that it gets stuck could be a bit of an issue. The fitment's not super tight. It slides in and out relatively easily. It, it doesn't kind of rattle around, but um, yeah, it, it slides in and out okay. But I can see it potentially getting stuck in there with grit and grime and yeah, it's gonna be difficult to, to push it out. There is a small lip right in here, so you could potentially get something in kind of behind it and tap it out. But um, yeah, that, well, I can foresee that potentially causing some issues in the future, but still, it's the only one I've got, so I'm just gonna send it and get that seated. One more on that side. Look at that. Perfection. Bueno. Okay, cool, so that frame is pretty much good to go. Once the seat post gets delivered, I can start with the build, although if it takes a while, I might just use one of the other seat posts that I've got hanging around here. I've got a new Sensar group set to go on this thing. This fancy carbon crank set that I showed off before. Yeah, should be should be pretty cool. We'll finally figure out if steel really is real because I've, uh, <laughs> I've got my doubts actually. But yeah, get subscribed so you don't miss the build. Hit the like button if you enjoyed this episode. And yeah, that's it. See you next time. <gasps> Ciao. It's the bonus clip time to do. -do. Right, I just realized I never showed you the weight of, of this frame and how it compares to like a carbon one. So let's have a quick look. Okay, so let's get that switched on there. And then if I grab this and we'll stick that on the scales like so. So the bare frame with absolutely nothing on it really weighs 2.24 kilos. I think this frame was just over one kilo, maybe, yeah, maybe just over a kilo, I think. Um, so yeah, this is more than twice the weight of that. So definitely quite chunky, but um, yeah, there you go. 2.24 2 kilos for a steel frame. There are certainly lighter steel frames out there, but from what I, what I read, that's, you know, that's pretty average actually. So yeah, um, uh, that, that's it. Stay tuned for the build and I'll see you next time. <gasps>